due to a family emergency last minute. And uh, the topic that I'm speaking on is once weekly dulaglutide, new multifactorial approach to type 2 diabetes management. This is working. That's my disclosure. Thank you. So let's start by looking at this case of Mr. ABC, who's a retired 60-year-old gentleman with type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular risk factors. Diabetes for seven years. Current therapy is metformin 1000 milligram twice a day. Glimipride 3 milligram once a day, Glargine 30 units bedtime. He's also on aterostatin and phenofibrate for his dyslipidemia. Blood pressures at 135, 75, BMI 28. So on the overweight side, and and, uh, and albumin excretion rate of 75 microgram per minute, body weight 90 kgs. Also gives history of GU infection with SGLT2 inhibitor in the past. So I think this is pretty much a standard case that we would see. Somebody who's on full dose of OHAs, tried to use an SGLT2, didn't work in terms of the adverse events and then was put on to insulin glargine. However, at this stage, his sugars are still 171, 232, A1C 8.4%, LDL 85, triglycerides 150, EGFR, which is dropped to 58. So you do also appreciate the, the, the renal risk coming in for this patient. Now, what does the ADA really recommend in terms of the use of glucose-lowering medications in management of type 2 diabetes? Which are the aspects where the ADA talks in terms of beyond lifestyle, beyond medications, looking at comorbid factors? When we talk about GLP-1 receptor agonists, the ADA speaks about using it in patients with cardiovascular disease or risk factors. You also... We'll talk about the preferable use of GLP-1 or SGLT2 inhibitors in the TKD. So when you talk about diabetic kidney disease, which are the drugs which will offer benefits? Well, SGLT2 inhibitors clearly have an edge over GLPs. But soon following, the SGLT2 inhibitors are GLP-1 receptor analogs from the renal aspect uh, point of view. And of course, finally, even from efficacy for weight loss, uh, that you're looking for drugs to achieve weight loss besides glycemic reduction, and vascular benefits, it's going to be GLP-1 receptor. So these are the three places where the newer recommendations strongly recommend the use of GLP-1. So for people with type 2 diabetes and established ASCVD or indicators of high ASCVD risk, like our, our, our case ABC in question, those with presence of heart failure or CKD, an SGLT2 inhibitor and or a GLP-1 RA would be with demonstrated CVD benefit is recommended as part of the glucose lowering regimen independent of A1C. Now what's important here is to note the fact that they talk about a SGLT2 and or a GLP1 with demonstrated CVD benefit. And this is important because very often we miss this point in the recommendation and it's not a class effect. Does every GLP1 have the benefit? Does every SGLT2 inhibitor have a benefit? No. And which is where you need to start closely seeing the data for each of these specific molecules and not just as a class effect. <clears throat> so GLP-1 receptor analogs in type 2 diabetes, what do they offer? Glycemic control and cardiorenal benefits. In terms of glycemic, you're talking about the reduction because of its effect at the pancreatic level, causing increased secretion of insulin. Importantly, suppression of alpha cells. The effect at the level of the liver, you're talking about also, the effect in terms of decreased gastric emptying, we're talking about the impact at the level of the adipose tissue and of course the, the satiety and the control of appetite center that GLP-1 brings about by its effect on the brain. In terms of the cardiovascular benefits, there are multiple postulated means of how through reduction in the inflammatory process to reduction in reduction of... of uh, adipokines again effects at the level of the brain that it's going to cause overall uh, a change in the milieu which, which lands up with 
reduction in atherosclerotic plaque formation as, as one of the means of reducing its cardiovascular um, risk. Also, in terms of the renal benefits, what we've been seeing is how does GLP offer renal benefit? It's again reduction in inflammation, reduction in oxidative stress, increased natriuresis. We had a wonderful talk earlier by Professor Tripathi about the roles of podocytes. So it's talking here again in terms of protection, protection at the level of you know preventing podocyte loss, mesangial dysfunction, endothelial dysfunction, all of this reducing tubular injury, eventually reducing renal fibrosis, reduced glomerulosclerosis. I do agree that a lot of these pathways are more postulated benefits and pathways for the protection that GLP may provide on the renal front. But let's look at the evidence, the GLP-1 RA and cardiovascular benefits, what's the evidence? When you talk about the three-point maze, and I'm talking about the group now as totality, if you look at the meta-analysis, the three-point maze reduction overall in favor of GLP-1s, you have a 14% relative risk reduction for the three-point maze. And specifically, if you look at the individual endpoints and you look at cardiovascular death, there again, if you put all the GLP-1s and look at the outcomes of the cardiovascular outcome trials, you get a 13% relative risk reduction in CV death in favor of GLP-1 RAs as compared to placebo in most of these cardiovascular outcome trials. What about further benefits? When you look at the data for fatal or non-fatal MI, and these, these are the three components. When you talk about the three-point maze, as most of you know, the components are cardiovascular death, uh, non-fatal MI and, and, and non-fatal stroke. So when you look at the evidence for MI, there again for the group you're getting a 10% relative risk reduction for GLP-1s and in terms of stroke, it's a 17% relative risk reduction in stroke for the GLP-1 group. What about the renal benefits? Again, looking at the same cardiovascular outcome trials in this meta-analysis, you're getting a 21% relative risk reduction in the composite kidney outcomes which included macroalbuminuria reduction. However, when you look at it, you didn't get a significant improvement in preventing the worsening of kidney function. You also then start looking at these cardiovascular outcome trials which have been conducted and you start seeing are there any gaps in the evidence with these GLP-1 RAs and which have been the major trials in this segment. You had LEADER for liraglutide, you had SUSTAIN-6 for injectable semaglutide, ELIXA for lixacinatide, Excel for once weekly exenatide. Some of these have never come to India. Harmony for albiglutide. Pioneer 6, which is for oral semaglutide, which we have here. And Amplitude O, which was for epiglenatide. Now, when you see this, you will see that usually in these trials, the patients are predominantly the ones for secondary prevention. That means those who had established cardiovascular disease and had an event previous MI or some peripheral uh, vascular disease with an angioplasty done and so on. So 70 to 80 percent of the patients in these trials were the ones which belong to secondary prevention group. Women were poorly represented in these trials, 30 percent, 35 percent. The mean years of follow-up was lesser and you look at anywhere between 1.3 to 2.1.3 to 3.8 years. Why the mean period was lesser? Because you had sicker patients so to say. You had patients with pre-existing disease and hence secondary prevention group. You will end up getting events earlier in the trial. And the mean HbA1c was somewhere between uh, 8 to 8.7. Now compared to that you start looking at the rewind trial which was for dulaglutide and you start seeing to the right of the, the column you will see the difference that the secondary prevention group here was only 31%. Almost 70% were patients belonging to primary prevention. That means those who had risk factors but who did not have an event in the past. So you are getting a relatively healthier population. Or let me put it this way, you had population that we land up seeing in our clinics. Most of here were us here working as physicians, diabetologists, are dealing with patients with diabetes who do not have pre-existing disease or 20 to 30%. Dr. Manoria Saab in the audience as a cardiologist would probably be dealing with patients who have 80% already pre-existing disease and undergone. But the rest would be largely dealing with primary 
um, primary prevention patients. And that's why this trial was more representative of that population. It, of course, also had 46% women as compared to the poor representation in the earlier ones. Because it had largely healthier population, the mean duration of the trial was 5.4 years. It went for longer period because the events would happen much slowly. And the A1C also was lower than in the other trials, 7.3%. Now, when you look at the comparison in terms of the composite reduction in the three-point maze, for the Rewind trial, you had a 12% relative risk reduction as compared to some of the higher reduction that you've seen for Sustain-6 or even for albiglutide in Harmony. Why does this translate into lesser benefit for dulaglutide as compared to the other ones? Well, to the individual who can understand the way trials are designed, probably no. So if you had a relatively healthier population in the trial, and yet you are getting 12% relative risk reduction, it actually speaks tons in favor of, of the drug and what it showed. So dulaglutide is the first and only GLP-1 RA to demonstrate both primary and secondary CV prevention in type 2 diabetes patients. It reduces the risk of major cardiovascular events such as non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, cardiovascular death in adults with type 2 diabetes with or without known cardiovascular disease. And this claim could not be made with the other GLP-1s because largely their population represented more of the secondary population, uh, secondary prevention population. So this is something which does go in favor of dulaglutide and, and this has been mentioned in the ADA standards of care also earlier. What are the possible mediators for this cardiovascular benefit? Well, <clears throat> you have all the benefits for this drug, A1C, blood pressure reduction, body weight, etc. But probably what's, what's thought is the two factors which predominantly are helping towards the cardiovascular benefit is one, the glycemic benefit, and second is the reduction in urine albumin creatinine ratio. Now let's look quickly at the renal outcomes. And I say this because I don't think I can stand on this platform and, and debate against the evidence for SGLT2 inhibitors in terms of their renal benefits. But there are patients who would require benefits even beyond the use of, of SGLT2 inhibitors or like our case here, patients who could not tolerate SGLT2 inhibitors. So do we not offer them the benefit? So when you look at the dulaglutide and its renal outcome benefits for composite renal outcome as compared to placebo, you had 15% relative risk reduction in favor of dulaglutide as, as compared to placebo. In new onset of macroalbumin urea, again a 23% relative risk reduction for dulaglutide as compared to placebo. Very important aspect which often gets missed. You know, we focus a lot on non-fatal MI, cardiovascular death, renal endpoints, but stroke doesn't get spoken. And, 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 and again, some of us are aware that a particular outcome trial, cardiovascular outcome trial for SGLT2 inhibitors did actually show an increase in stroke. The, the argument there was this happened in patients after the trial had ended, blah, blah, blah. But it did raise some questions about the stroke, though not validated or not strong enough for us to be really worried that SGLT2 inhibitors increase the risk of stroke. But in terms of benefit, GLP-1s have consistently shown us benefit in stroke reduction. So you, you look at this aspect in terms of outcomes for dulaglutide. For non-fatal stroke, 24% relative risk reduction. For ischemic stroke, 25% relative risk reduction. Non-fatal stroke or all-cause that 12% risk reduction. Disabling stroke, 20%. The only place where it did not uh, show any benefit was in the hemorrhagic stroke. But every other aspect of stroke, dulaglutide has scored well. What about dulaglutide and its impact on cognitive impairment? This is a separate study, not a cardiovascular outcome trial. This had about um, 9,000 patients, I think, which has shown, again, that in every aspect for cognitive improvement, there was a 14% relative risk reduction. Patients on dula had lower risk of baseline score adjusted substantive cognitive impairment. Additional adjustment of age, sex, duration, stroke didn't alter the results. So clear, again, evidence on stroke reduction and and. And, and preventing cognitive impairment, which becomes so important. There were some updates from ESD last year in terms of dulaglutide versus oral semaglutide. What about adherence? And this is important because we have both these drugs as, as the main ones that we use in the GLP-1 RA segment in India today. In this paper at ESD, they showed that even though dulaglutide is an injectable, though a once-weekly injectable, 
the the percentage of patients who, who adhered to therapy was higher in the dulaglutide group as compared to the oral sema group 64.5 as compared to 50.3 also another way of looking at it is persistence of therapy so again in the dula segment you had about 72% persistence of patients as compared to 57.4 in the oral semaglutide now with us having both of this here i'm sure somebody would be looking at this data in india also and trying to come out with what is the real world evidence in india and i can see supratik's face lit up there ki why haven't i done this so far let me start looking at it so it will be interesting to see whether in terms of adherence and i and i, I honestly feel more data and studies from all our clinics should come out for adherence and compliance and when i'm saying this i'm also pointing out to my my educators from my clinic who are in the audience who, who help us for all the data collection that once back in the clinic on monday let's talk about more compliance and adherence data so let's go back to our case mr abc um and and just reminding for those who came in later somebody with 7 years of diabetes on on most tolerated uh, oha dosages glargine uh, etc and and at this stage um with with his sugar still high at 8.4% um and 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 gfr at 58 couldn't tolerate sglt2 inhibitors what was done was started with dulaglutide or trulicity 1.5 mg once a week metformin was continued you do have the option of continuing glimepiride and those who think it's not safe and want to monitor and reduce or stop that's your option i may not do that all the time and starting to reduce glargine because you're adding dulaglutide and some of them respond very very well to glp ones so you you be cautious reduce the insulin and then of course monitor and titrate the dose continue of course the 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 statin and and fibrate for such a patient what does the future hold for glp1 a drug class that proves to provide newer formulations so what's what's the pipeline you have the once monthly uh, injection which is epiglenotide once monthly formulation so you already had the weekly one which was part of the amplitude o data that i showed but you actually going to look at a once monthly glp1 you are looking at the oral non peptide glp1 which is uh, which is an elilili uh, under development product newer indications for these existing drugs so ckd in type 2 diabetes we know today that you can use dulaglutide up to 15 ml per minute of gfr but you're going to get probably uh, other indications as well nfld and nash continue to be an interest area uh, obesity of course you have some of the glp ones which are approved for non diabetic obesity um and 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 um, you will be getting much more indications there in in obesity and then some newer molecules you heard a talk yesterday by shrinivas on the twin creatines the dual glp1 the gip glip ones tirzepatide we've had the uh, opportunity to work on two of the tirzepatide phase 3 trials at our center and i'm happy to say that um, we are part of a publication of an important study called surpass ap to surpass a, a asia pacific combo and that manuscript has been accepted at and by nature and hopefully we'll be able to share the publication in weeks to come um but what's exciting is to know that you also have a triple triple creatine if you can call it where you'll have gibglip along with a glucagon agonist which is in its phase 2 so exciting times for this class of glp1 ras and it probably will rise to much higher up in the hierarchy of where we use it in terms of recommendations it's already up there we'll probably be using it more often so let me conclude glp ones have emerged as a preferred drug in patients with type 2 diabetes at risk for cvd and even in patients with established cvd they've demonstrated cardiovascular benefits in multiple outcome trials rewind is the only cardiovascular outcome trial which had majority type 2 by diabetes patients with cardiovascular risk factors and not established disease and hence primary prevention population once weekly is the first agent once weekly dulaglutide is the first agent to show cv protection in a population where the majority did not have a previous cardiovascular event newer analysis have demonstrated potential additional potential benefits with once weekly dulaglutide glp1 rs as a class continue to progress in terms of research on newer formulations newer indications and also of course newer molecules which we'll see at thank you so much right